Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us for tonight's webinar. Um, I'm thrilled to have back to our webinar. I think, uh, Steve, I think you're the only two-time uh, two attendee here. Um, our first webinar that we did with Dr. Choi was on March 30th, um, really right in the heart of, of early COVID. And we're, we're, we're really thrilled to have Dr. Choi back. Um, First, I, I'd like to thank uh, the Yale Alumni Health Network for uh, co-sponsoring uh, co-sponsoring the event with us. Uh, my name is Sam Hendel. I'm, I'm one of the co-founders of Accelerate Yale. Um, my, my day job, I'm portfolio manager and president of a boutique investment firm, Levin Easterly Partners. And I also, uh, by, I guess uh, by night, I co-founded Data Miner about 11 years ago and uh, also uh, do a lot with Accelerate Yale as co-founder and Yale Angels. And um, I'm really thrilled to have, um, to have with me tonight, Dr. Stephen Choi. Um, Dr. Choi is the Chief Quality Officer, Vice President and Associate Dean of the Yale School of Medicine and Yale New Haven Health System, which is the largest healthcare provider in the state of Connecticut. And he's responsible for developing and executing the single unified strategy um, for healthcare across the entire system. Um, and Dr. Choi and his team, they're responsible for preventing all hospital acquired infections, preventing patient harm and approving clinical outcomes across all their patients. And Dr. Choi and his team, of course, have been extremely involved in uh, the COVID response, um, both for Yale University and the Yale New Haven Health System. Um, he's regularly appeared on national, national and local television, including CNN, The New York Times, ABC, NBC, and a few more that you, you wrote me in your bio, Steve. And uh, you might recognize Steve also from press conferences. Um, he is a regular attendee at Governor Lamont's press conferences here in Connecticut. And um, he's been uh, instrumental in fighting COVID here around the country and also giving, giving me some advice um, when, when I have some, some, some questions. And, um, and is also, of course, a dear friend of mine. Um, so Dr. Choi, um, thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm, I apologize to everyone listening uh, that, we, that we both are big Jets fans and, uh, and are showing off our jerseys behind me here. Um, but maybe I will, um, I'll start it off. Um, you know, it was clearly a, a very different world the last time, uh, the last time we, we, we did this. And, you know, now we're, we're dealing with back to school. Um, the decision, the very challenging decision to send our children um, back to elementary school, to college. I mean, uh, Steve, I would love to hear your thoughts on, um, on you know, the, the risks inherent um, in doing this, what you're doing, with, with your family um, and um, you know, any advice you have for parents that are you know, struggling with this decision or just ways we can stay safe um, in, in the process of sending our kids? Sure, uh, first of all, thank you for having me back, Sam. It's, it's a pleasure um, and I wanna thank the Yale Alumni Group and uh, Accelerate Yale and the Yale Health Network uh, for hosting this event. And, and I think your, your, your first question it might, it might be the primary question that most of the attendees are, are thinking of that have uh, tuned in tonight. So I think um, what we have to anticipate um, in the upcoming weeks and months is that um, this is the sort of most vulnerable time for for all of us, including our, our children and our families and our extended families, uh, for what will be a likely uptick in cases. Um, you know, with, with my kids, they, they are gonna go back to school. Um, and as you know, for, for those of you who live in Connecticut, every school district has been given the opportunity to set up guidelines for how they'll bring students back. Uh, parents for, in most districts have a choice of going remote or going in person. Um, but it's really back to the basics, which is, you know, make sure your kids are wearing masks at all times, um, social distancing, and then hand hygiene. Those are the three uh, most critical steps. Now, that is a lot easier said than done. And as you know, as, as we have young kids, um, it's hard for a young kid, a uh, child, whether they're five or seven and, and even teenagers, to, to wear a mask at all times. So, you know, one of the things that I've recommended to parents is that if you have not been practicing uh, wearing a mask at home or, or out, th this is the time to do it. Uh, the last thing you wanna uh, put your child through is, is put him or her through an environment where they're not comfortable wearing a mask. Um, and that could be for three hours in, in some schools, it's a full day. 
So, you know, make sure you wear the mask uh, at home and, and make sure, you, you know, you note and, and point out that the masks are fitted properly, you know, make sure it's not hanging below the nose, which many adults do as well. Um, and then just, just iterate to the children that, you know, they, they've got to keep their distance at school. Um, and then beyond that, there's very little that parents can do. The rest is really up to the schools, right? And how the schools have managed um, their facilities to, to distance children, uh, to make sure that there's uh, adequate supply of hand sanitizer uh, throughout the building, and then to, to safely space the kids, whether it's in the classroom, um, those schools that are gonna provide lunch or, or snack time, um, and certain events where, where kids are going to gather, whether it's outside or in, inside, they just got to make sure there's adequate spacing. And it, how about at home with, with, with parents? Um, you know, I think we, we've all spent a lot of time outside seeing friends at a distance, and that's been, that's been really nice this summer. Um, is there anything the parents should be doing differently now that, you know, a lot of kids are going to school, especially parents, um, you know, c c communities where, where a lot of parents are sending their kids at the same time, and you have these, the, you, know, you have the, the um, you know, all the pods. Um, a, a lot of a lot of these schools are having pods of kids, you know, half yeah. a class or a group together. Um, any advice for for you know parent behavior um, during this unusual period? Sure. So um, th there's really nothing that will uh, guarantee a zero risk interaction um, apart from you know staying apart uh, from, from all families or all people outside your home but I think exactly what you said is is what parents and families should continue doing um, certainly throughout the fall and in the winter where we expect cases to go up so um, distancing outside is the best means for social interaction uh, you know I, I would make it a practice to not go into other people's homes but but if you do need to for uh, cases such as, you know, if you're at a friend's house and you've got to use the restroom, then, then put a mask on and, and go in and use the restroom, make sure you wipe down the surfaces. But uh, continuing to do exactly what you said is, uh, is probably the best measure that we could take as parents. And then teaching our kids to do that as well. Great, great. And, and, and we'll certainly get, get, get to some questions on masks la later on in our talk and, and vaccines as well. Um, I have sort of two more questions on the school topic. You know, one. What do you think happens if um, if there's a case in 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 in, a, in, in your school in, in your child's school? Um, what what's going to be the result? Is the whole school going to shut down? Are they going to shut it shut it down by pods? I assume it's all different by district. But any any thoughts around um, you know what happens if there's a case? Sure. Well, well, ultimately, in the state of Connecticut, and for most states, you know, that decision will, will be uh, determined at the local state uh, department level. Um, they do have reporting uh, obligations to the, the state health department, but whatever that local district determines is the safest thing for the, for the children, and of course, the, the faculty and the staff that work, in, that work at the school, they'll be the final decision makers. So there's really no magic number in terms of if you hit this number, you're gonna have to shut down. But certainly if there's one child that tests positive and they do proper contact tracing and determine that there's really no other risk, then that would not be a means to, to immediately shut down the school. So I know a lot of parents out there wondering and they're concerned if you know one child tests positive that the whole school is shut, shut down. That, that would be highly unlikely, Sam. Great, thank you, Steve. Um, and just re really quickly on, on sort of the transmission, you know, I've read about receptors, that kids have different types of, you know, not as many receptors. And what, what sort of, what, what sort of you know, your, um, you know, your view on your know, kids' ability to get the virus and then also transmit to family members? Sure. So there have been a number of recent reports um, since the outbreak back in December and January overseas. Um, what's clear is that children definitely have a milder form of the disease. Um, can they have a severe form? Absolutely. It does seem to be restricted to, to children with comorbidities or, or chronic medical conditions. But what is of concern is that children can, can certainly um, transmit and carry the the virus, um, particularly in an asymptomatic state. So what that means is you could have what is a regularly normal appearing child um, not is exhibiting the symptoms of, of the classic COVID syndrome that 
let's say you and I may exhibit if we're sick, but, but they can transmit it. And the most recent study said, you know, kids 12 and above, uh, sort of high school, middle school uh, children are more likely to transmit than, than kids that are in the, you know, primary elementary school. So that, that's a risk. And that's something, you know, we've discovered recently in, in, in some of the case reports. Um, and then most recently, I'm sure many of the panelists have heard that they've there's uh, described or a, a validated uh, case in Hong Kong of a gentleman who's who's been infected twice uh, yeah. with a different strain. And we've we've known that this was a risk. Uh, we know, like as many other RNA or respiratory viruses, the the virus you know has an ability to to mutate. Um, and so I, I think that's another risk, but it's it's extremely low given the numbers of people that have been infected. You know, we haven't seen an exorbitant number of reinfections. So we're we're optimistically hoping that, that that's that's a rare occurrence. Great. Um, so you know, this summer we we had you know the very very acute period, especially here in the Northeast. Um, you know, that has certainly calmed down. And then, of course, you know, I, I don't know if you call it a second wave or, you know, kind of the rest of the country, um, unfortunately, catching up to us here. Um, you know, what can we learn from, you know, the, the experience of, you know, of, of sort of the, the, the present time, what we're seeing in the Sun Belt, Florida, Texas, Arizona, et cetera? Yeah. So I, I think uh, most epidemiologists and certainly, you know, our experts in, um, in infection, dis infectious diseases and in the public health school at Yale um, have all felt that those states uh, likely, um, and in some cases very certainly, uh, reopen their um, businesses or, or uh, areas where, where they could have um, decreased transmission too early. And I think that was the biggest challenge. And in a lot of the contact tracing cases of the super spreaders down, down in the South and the Midwest, and they've been traced back to indoor dining, uh, indoor bars. And so I think it's activities like that that, that we're still trying to discourage uh, for the most part uh, here in Connecticut and have been doing pretty well uh, for the last four months consistently that will allow us to enjoy a relatively COVID-free fall. And, and that's what we're hoping for, too. I think we've done a tremendous job here in the state of Connecticut, and you know, I'm very happy to see that we've been able to uh, enjoy a, a pretty, uh, pretty safe summer for the most part. Great, great. And so, you really indoor dining and bars seem to be the area that you know have caused the most spread. Um, you know, I, I, I love your, you know, one thing: the economy is clearly a very important factor here. Um, sure. Delivery restaurants and outdoor. Um, I, you know, I, I think I know your opinion. I, I, I love, to, lo, love to hear it, though, and sort of, you know, ways we can kind of keep our businesses in business. Um, sure. No, and, and that's, that's, that's vital to, to, the, to the overall health of the community, right, for, and for the state. So, you know, we, we encourage folks to, you know, um, you know, order out if possible or, you know, um, have delivery. And if you're going to eat at a restaurant, you know, we highly recommend that you eat outdoors. Uh, and of course, the safest thing is to eat at home. Um, and I think one of the highlights of, of COVID is that, you know, people have really enjoyed cooking at home and, you know, enjoying the company of their family members and, you know, experimenting with, you know, different recipes and, and so forth. But, you know, the safest thing is to eat at home. But if you are going to choose to eat uh, out and, you know, we're not going to reprimand you or shame you for eating out, you know, I, I would highly recommend that you eat outdoors. And of course, if you're going to go indoors to use the restroom, that you put on your mask. Perfect. Um, and, you know, now I, I, I was joking to you the other day that um, you know we, we we just bought two heat lamps for uh, for for the long, lonely, dark winter that that, that could happen here. Um, what's your great outlook? Great choice. Great choice. Yeah, I think I'm trying to think of other things. You know, at the end of this, you can give me a list of things I can buy for for, for, for this, winter, <laughs> this winter here. Um, but love to hear your thoughts on um, fall and winter, and you know, is the is the virus more you know, um, you know more transmissible dur dur during colder weather, um, and what should we sort of look out for um, for the next you know four, five, six months? Sure. So, so most of what um, we're we're seeing are based on observations, um, and you know, we could look back from 
um, the countries in, in the Southern Hemisphere and how they fared during their summer months. And it clearly appears that the virus is less likely to transmit um, d during the summer or the warmer climates or the warmer months. So in that respect, we're anticipating that, you know, during the fall and the winter that uh, the virus will, will have a higher transmission rate. Um, you know, that being said, there's also behavioral patterns in the fall and the winter that increase the likelihood of the virus um, transmitting throughout a community. And that's because people tend to gather indoors. So to your point, um, it's a big risk if we see more groups of individuals and communities, um, you know, uh, families have, having parties, you know, outside of their sort of inner pod where, you know, they're exposed to other people, particularly those who've traveled from high risk areas. So that, that's, that's a risk. And I think, you know, in the fall and winter, we just got to remind ourselves that, you know, we did a great job controlling the transmission rates um, uh, during, during the summer, and we need to continue practicing those behaviors. Perfect. Um, let's get into treatment. Um, so therapeutics, um, you know, it, this, it's now been six months of... <laughs> I, I promised Alex she, she could zoom on here. You, you could say, hi, then you got to go back. Okay. Hey, Alex, what's up, buddy? So for, for the audience, Alex and my daughter Zoe are, are besties, so uh, we, we, we see her a lot. Um, so we, we've learned a ton, and I, thi I, th I think because of that, you know, I, I'm optimistic that, you know, whether you want to call it the second wave or, you know, uh, part two, uh, it is not nearly going to be as um, dramatic or severe as the wave that we felt in the spring. So there are a lot of therapeutics that... Um, we trialed during a you know health crisis such as in pandemic. So there are a lot of drugs that we used um, last year that we are no longer using and we have found that are not effective and more importantly, that they could be dangerous. So the therapies that we've stuck with and that are still part of the Yale protocol are, are steroids, um, which is an anti-inflammatory. Um, and that's really essential because uh, probably the most invasive part of this infection is the, the inflammatory response that the host mounts against the virus. So it's not necessarily the virus itself um, replicating inside your lungs that's causing most of the damage. It's actually your own body um, reacting to that virus. And so we have steroids. Uh, we have another uh, monoclonal antibody, uh, tocilizumab, that, that, that targets a certain protein to suppress that inflammatory response. Um, we've been using the drug, drug remdesivir, which has gotten a lot of public attention. Um, that drug was uh, originally used as an antiviral therapy for uh, Ebola virus uh, many years ago. And then we have got other sort of, you know, non-medical therapeutics that we've found have been very effective. Um, and for those, those of you who've been paying attention, uh, there's this maneuver called proning, uh, where you actually uh, put patients in the hospital who, who are severely ill on their stomachs. Um, and, and that helps the oxygen get to the lungs uh, effectively, and then prohibits or you know, mitigates some of the lung disease that these patients have as well. And, and then th there's a lot of buzz around the convalescent plasma. Um, and that's you know, getting blood samples or, or, or donors who've uh, recovered from COVID. And theoretically, um, the, the, those patients should have antibodies that are effective in neutralizing COVID. And when we transfuse them, there's, there has been some benefit to certain populations, uh, you know, particularly if you give it early. But um, we're still, you know, undergoing, you know, hundreds of clinical trials. Um, and we'll, we'll learn more, but we've learned uh, quite a bit from, from last year. So I, I feel optimistic that we're going to be much more prepared this year. So hydroxychloroquine, you know, sounds sound like all, all, the, all the buzz there is... Uh, yeah. Uh, is that I have a colleague uh, here who's causing a lot of buzz, too. Um, so, you know, our, our position at Yale is that... Um, there are certain case studies that have shown that there might be some benefit with hydroxychloroquine, but with the randomized controlled trial, which is really our gold standard to determine if a 
therapeutic or an intervention or treatment is effective. Um, th that has shown that there's, there's no clinical effectiveness with uh, hydro hydroxychloroquine. Um, and what that means is, you know, if I give you uh, hydroxychloroquine, I give another patient a placebo, there's no difference uh, between those groups and you randomize those groups. So, you know, you, it doesn't matter, you know, what um, sort of demographic or comorbidity you have, you just randomize uh, back and forth between patients. But furthermore, we've actually found that um, giving hydroxychloroquine, particularly with some other medications, can be deadly. So we, we do not use that at Yale, and, and I would say most academic centers uh, do not use that as part of their treatment regimen. So let's get to testing. Um, you know, uh, clearly you know, the country still has some issues in supply chain. Would love to hear, you know, what's going on in, in, in Connecticut and sort of your, your, what you're seeing around the country around testing. And also would love to hear about the, the Yale MBA partnership um, on saliva testing and, and, and your views and you know, what, what, you know, I think that got a, a FDA emergency uh, authorization, but what, what does that actually, and same with covalescent plasma, what does that actually mean? Sure. So um, we could start with the last subject, which is the saliva test. So um, Nate Grubaugh's lab at the School of Public Health at Yale, um, you know, patented uh, the saliva test. And so uh, that test allows for, for patients to just uh, provide a saliva sample, which is a lot easier to collect than a nasopharyngeal swab, uh, which is a pretty deep swab. So for those of you in the audience who've had that test, you know, I've had multiple tests, um, you know, simply because we're testing healthcare workers at Yale. You know, it's, it, it's, it's very painful, it's very uncomfortable. So there's a lot of ease with that saliva test. Um, and it also uh, does not require what we call the RNA extraction. So we're trying to extract that COVID protein from the saliva um, isn't part of that testing process. And so th that helps with a lot of the supplies that have limited you know, mass testing throughout the world. Uh, but it's, it's, it's for you know, emergency use uh, uh, only right now. So it doesn't mean it's gone through the proper regulatory channels that a FDA approved test per se would. So we still stand by you know, the nasal pharyngeal swab as the gold standard uh, for the PCR. And we've also found that you know, the saliva test you know, isn't as sensitive as that nasal pharyngeal PCR. And for, for a disease like this, we wanna have the high sensitivity. And, and what that means is you don't wanna have false negatives. So if I have a, a margin of false negatives, then you know, I, I will miss a certain percentage of patients who are actually positive, but falsely test negative. Um, the, the flip side of that is you, know, you, you could have a low specificity where you test people as positive when in fact they're negative, but for a pandemic, you'd rather err on the side that you know you don't miss the positives, and, and you may you know call some people out that actually aren't infected. So, so that's that's some of the limitations. Um, and you know, the School of Public Health is you know has an agreement uh, arrangement with the NBA, and they're handling the samples from players and the staff and, and personnel to, to do those tests. Um, but we we currently do not have it available for for mass testing uh, as we do with the. PCR nasal pharyngeal test. And you know, I, I, there are, there, um, there's a lot of Q and A, and we will get to audience Q and A a little later on um, in, in our talk. There is a question here that just popped up, um, and it's very timely. What do you think about the new CDC advice to only test symptomatic patients? Um, <laughs> uh, who, who who asked that? Uh, Jordan. Well, that, that just came out yesterday. Um, so, um, you know, we do follow CDC guidelines. Um, um, I'm going to reserve, you know, my personal opinion, but um, it's, it's a departure from w what we've been doing. Um, so I, I think, you know, there's a lot of buzz going on about, you know, how and why that was written. So we'll be speaking with them and, and making sure we understand. It doesn't say that you shouldn't, but it's, ba it's basically uh, given us guidance that it's not necessary. Um, but, you know, I, I think it, it depends on the circumstance. 
Yeah, and I, I know there are, there are a lot of schools, um, especially a lot of private schools, um, that are doing you know these sort of tests, you know, at home sort of. I don't know if at home, but you know, sort of a quick test, saliva, you know, rapid test. And I know Yale was, or not Yale, but New Haven had rapid testing through the community Abbott testing. Would love to hear your thoughts around you know what these private schools are. I mean, we're sending our kids to public school, and yeah. There's no, there's, there's not enough tests to test everyone every week, unfortunately. Sure, sure. So it, it's, it's a great, it's a great question, and you know, I, I, I'm not here to criticize, you know, any of those tests. You know, I, I think more testing uh, than less is is critical, um, and that's one of the reasons why, you know, we suffered a pandemic here in the U.S. is that we we just didn't have the the availability of testing that we do have now. But with regard to that rapid test. Um, that also is a test that has limited sensitivity. Um, so, you know, the reports are anywhere from 10 to 15% uh, sensitivity uh, uh, gaps. So you're gonna miss about 10 to 15% of, of positives. So that test is great if you've got a positive test, because if you're, if you're positive, you're most certainly uh, positive for COVID, but if you're negative, you know, there's, there's still, some margin of error where you, you can actually be walking around with, with you know, active uh, disease. Um, or, you know, you could also be positive because you've got, you know, recovered disease where you're shedding the virus, you know, which can happen for weeks and, and in some cases months. All right. Um, another topic that, um, you know, that, that, that's kind of happening in the Northeast right now, and I guess initially, you know, Florida wasn't letting New Yorkers in and now it's now <laughs> vice versa. Um, oh. What do you think about the, the travel ban? And in addition, you know, you have all these students who are coming into colleges. You know, you're 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 at you're at Yale. Um, what, what is Yale doing? Um, you know, with, with all these people coming from all over the world and <clears throat> all, all fifty states coming back on campus. Uh, great, uh, gr great question. Uh, that that was a hot topic in, in the Yale community for for the past. Uh, four to six weeks. Um, and that was in response to Governor Lamont's executive order. And, you know, I, I want to just clarify, it, it's not a travel ban, it's a travel <laughs> advisory, but there is a civil penalty now if you don't follow this advisory. And so uh, what the State Department of Health has done is that every Tuesday, and you know, the, the list was updated yesterday, and I'm, I'm happy to say the list is, is, is decreasing in numbers as opposed to increasing, um, uh, provides a list of states where the case rates are high, and therefore, if you've traveled from those states um, and, and have spent more than 24 hours uh, in those states um, and then return or come into Connecticut, you are required to self-quarantine for 14 days. And that is a absolute critical step in, in keeping our state from having those higher rates. And, and the, the number to remember is 10. So if you have a, a positive rate of uh, more than 10 residents per 100,000, uh, or a positive test rate of 10% or more over a seven day average, and, and that's why they choose Tuesday to update the, the list then you're considered a high-risk state. And so what we've done at Yale is we followed that travel advisory. So if you have um, a faculty member who happens to travel to, let's say, Texas, um, for whatever reason, uh, upon return, he, he's required, he or she is required to self-quarantine and they can't return to work. Um, and we've done that with the students too that, that have been coming uh, in throughout the, um, uh, the campus that you know if they're coming from one of those states that they have to quarantine and i i, I have a, a very apropos question coming from my, my dear friend barbara monk um talking about an uh, an uptick you know with the new york times had this big article today showing all of this all the cases around the country at different colleges um yeah. how quick is the yale community to deal with you know an outbreak in the college population yeah, so we, we've been preparing for this for, for you know, close to a year now. So we've got um, an extensive um, infrastructure for, for mass testing, uh, which, which is absolutely critical. Uh, we've got an extensive um, plan for contact tracing uh, in conjunction with the local public health department. 
and then we've, we've also got, you know, uh, facilities to isolate, you know, students uh, or, or, you know, uh, travelers from, from, from within the community. So those are, those are the key elements is to make sure you could, you could test uh, extensively, do, do proper contact tracing, and then provide the facilities to, to isolate those who are at high risk. And that's some of the primary reasons that, you know, the, the virus got out of control throughout the world is that you didn't have those three components. Great. Um, I, we're going to get to vaccines right after this question that I have here. Um, and this is on, you mentioned this to me, um, which I found super crazy and interesting, um, the uh, Yale sewage study. Uh, can you uh, elucidate on what Yale is doing um, with uh, sewage in the state of Connecticut? Yeah. So, you know, Yale actually, you know, uh, conducts a number of studies with sewage. Um, this is just one of them. But um, there's a researcher um, at Yale um, who has been testing sewage samples um, through the public waste plant. And with that sample, they're testing, you know, uh, COVID RNA particles. And for, for those of you who've, who've been reading up on COVID, you know that you know, one of the ways of transmission was through a fecal oral transmission where um, people uh, shed virus in their stool. Um, so th the concept is you know, if they're shedding virus in the stool, it will likely be in the sewage. And so um, we have our scientists who've been plotting the, uh, the particles at various uh, communities and have been, you know, tracing it to see if there's an uptick. Um, and we've seen little bumps um, around Connecticut, but you know, fortunately they've been coming back down. But if you trace uh, the historical trends of the sewage levels of, of COVID, they correlate uh, almost identically to the case rates that we had over the past year. So that, that's another means for us to you know, monitor and, and do surveillance for what the prevalence is um, you know, migrating to throughout Connecticut. Amazing. Yeah, it's pretty pretty fascinating. Yeah, sewage. It's crazy. Yeah. Big topic: vaccines. Um, yeah. The, the 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 hopeful savior here. Um, you know, there are four major you know major vaccine candidates right now. Um, would love to hear your thoughts. Timing, efficacy. Um, how do you think the whole thing is going to play out to distribute all this vaccine? Um, what do you think? I know, you tell me. <laughs> it's, no it's, great. It's, it, it's, um, it, it's a hot topic. They're great questions, very difficult questions. Um, you know, there's over 100 uh, vaccines under trial right now. Um, but the ones you're referring to are the ones that are you know, in phase three or who've, you know, who, who've received uh, authorization for use. So the only two that, that I'm aware of uh, approved for use are overseas. There's one in China, one in, um, I believe, Russia. Uh, but the the ones that are actively being trialed right now in phase three, um, there's approximately eight of those. Um, and there's many others in, in phase one and two. Um, and what's important for the audience to know is that, you know, the, the phase three trial is really where you do massive uh, clinical trials of the vaccine uh, with placebo as well. And the, the number of subjects, volunteers, of course, who are required to complete phase three are, are in the tens of thousands. Um, and the two of the top candidates that you know, are getting a lot of publicity are the Moderna and the, the Pfizer vaccine. Um, so right now, the FDA has uh, issued a statement that says that you know, if we have 50% efficacy, that they will issue authorization for use um, you know, in order to uh, adequately uh, vaccinate and, and protect and provide immunity in the community. You know, you, you've got to vaccinate and provide immunity for, you know, roughly 70% of the population. So if you think about, you know, that, that math, it, it's a little concerning that, you know, 70% of the population has to have immunity. But if the virus is only 50% effective, um, we'd be falling short of that. But, but one thing to remember is that there'll be a significant number of people who've already, you know, been exposed, um, have recovered, and theoretically should have immunity. And, you know, we're hoping that these vaccines will be above that minimal threshold of 50%. The, the production and, and the supply uh, chain 
issue is, is going to be really, really difficult. Um, and, you know, the government has issued, you know, quite a bit of, of, of dollars, you know, in, upwards of billions to these companies in exchange, not just for the R&D process, but also um, for, for, you know, guaranteeing that they'll have adequate doses uh, for the general population. Yep, that makes and, and I would love to hear your thoughts on you know I've heard mRNA that I think the Pfizer and Moderna are mRNA where they attack the 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 the, the yeah. and then maybe the Johnson and Johnson one is the whole virus. Can you explain that um, to me and, and everyone listening, kind of what that means and how we decide what and when we should be all taking the vaccine? Sure. So this is part of the, you know, phase one, two, and three trials. Um, vaccines have different mechanisms for how they confer immunity. Uh, some vaccines, you know, target a cer certain uh, particle, protein, or, or portion of a virus um, so that your body builds that response. Some vaccines actually are delivered as a attenuated form of the vaccine itself, so a virus itself, meaning that you actually get injected with a, a, a weakened or, or dead particle uh, of that virus, so you build that immunity. But they're all different mechanisms that work, um, and not one is, is better than the other uh, as a sort of broad stroke statement. The most important thing is, do these patients um, develop effective immunity, and do these patients who, who do get the vaccine are they free from long-term uh, side effects? So I don't think it's important to look at the mechanism because we have very effective vaccines that target, you know, uh, one portion of a bacteria or one portion of a virus, or we've got vaccines that, you know, attack the entirety of a, of a particle or a, or a microbe that are just as effective than the ones that, you know, just attack part of it. So uh, the most important thing is, again, to see what these phase three clinical trials uh, pan out uh, in terms of results. And, you know, hopefully we'll have that, you know, by the new year. And, you know, we're hoping that um, that's what's going to happen. It'll, it'll be a record time that, you know, uh, such a vaccine gets approved. It's, as you know, it usually takes years. Yeah. And in, in terms of, you know, do you think this is in a vaccine that we're, gonna, we're all going to need to take every year? Um, kind of like the flu. I, I'd be curious also your, your thoughts on, on, on the on flu and, you know, the flu vaccine and, you know, uh, kind of in conjunction with, you know, this flu season, I guess. Um, and sort of, is this going to be something that we're going to be taking every year and dealing with like the flu um, going forward? Or is this something that we can fully eradicate? Um, I think it's a little wishful thinking that, you know, COVID-19 or, you know, SARS-CoV-2 is going to be fully eradicated, unfortunately. Um, I think very much like the flu, it, it will be likely um, that we'll, we'll have a vaccine, but that, you know, every year that we'll have to have a booster um, that's modified uh, based on the strain uh, of the virus. And so I, I think it'll be very much like the flu. Um, so I, 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 I'm assuming that the, the vaccines that do get approved will have pretty good efficacy that, you know, you can last through a full year and just get an annual booster. And that would be my guess. But, you know, it's, it's really hard to say, Sam, because, yeah. you know, we haven't seen a single vaccine, you know, out on the market that's been effective yet. So, you know, a lot of this is, you know, hopeful anticipation. Um, you know, some, you know, some inside info that we're hearing, you know, across the industry. But, you know, I think likely it'll be a, uh, an annual booster. And then, you know, in terms of the immune system of young people or, or, or seniors, um, is, is a vaccine more effective for, for different age groups or different de demographic groups? And so who should get this vaccine first? Is it frontline workers, frontline healthcare workers? And then we sort of move from there? Um, yes and yes. <laughs> uh, Certain vaccines are, are uh, more effective for certain uh, age groups, and, and that that it really is the critical nature of the uh, particularly the phase two, phase three trials, um, and and some of the vaccines currently that are under uh, investigation are actually in the combined phase two and three trial. I think the Pfizer trial is a combined uh, phase two and three, but you know 
we'll, we'll have to see you know, if, if they have you know equal efficacy. Um, there's a good chance that it won't. Uh, and in terms of who do we vaccinate first? Uh, absolutely, you know the high risk patients um, or the high risk populations and, and those who are at risk because um, uh, they're exposed, like healthcare workers. You know should, should clearly have prior to, prioritization uh, for organic vaccination. Yeah, very much. Agree. That, that that that'll be that'll be a, another hill that we'll have to climb once the vaccines get approved. It'll, it'll be a challenge. And be, be, before I go to, to our Q&A, we, we have a lot of great questions here. I, the most important question of the evening is, are we going to have a football season? <laughs> are we, we going to be able to watch our Jets lose again and again and again? What, what, what do you think on Well, what? you know, Sam, uh, as luck would have it, the, the first year that Tom Brady is not playing in the AFC East, <laughs> football will be canceled. Um, so – you know, there's no bigger football fan than uh, probably you and I, but I, I think it, it would be uh, extremely unlikely to see a, a football season go, go um, through this year, you know, with the full 16-game schedule. I just think the complexity and the nuances of, of uh, football itself with, with practice fields, uh, the number of teams um, traveling, back and forth uh, between the country, the, 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 the size of the facility that's required for, for these games, I, I think it'll be extremely difficult. But, you know, we'll see. I mean, um, I think one indication that that was a red flag is that, you know, the Big Ten canceled their football season, you know, weeks ago. And I think the likelihood that, you know, other NCAA leagues or the NFL can, you know, success, successfully get through a full season is unfortunately pretty low. Yep, I, yep. I agree. Yeah. I think the, 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 yeah. the bubbles are working. Lots of testing. Yeah. Everyone stays in one area. Uh, yeah. That's working. I, I don't really see how you have a traveling uh, circus. Nope. Here. Yeah, it'll be tough. Yeah. Um, all right, so I, I'm going to move on to some, some questions. We've got some great questions from the audience. Uh, we've had a number on um, aerosolization and, in particular, HVAC systems. Um, and maybe we'll go back to school here. Um, you know, how do you think about, you know, what, 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 what procedures and, um, you know, what, one, I'd be curious, you know, what, what, you know, what, what you're doing at Yale. And oh, I, I didn't ask our mask question, so I will get to that after this. Um, but in terms of, you know, some of these uh, devices on the market, um, circulation of air in, in an apartment building or in a school, what do we yeah. do? Yeah, so, you know, the, the thing to remember is that no circulation is bad circulation, right? So if you've got stagnant circulation, that, that, that puts you at risk uh, if there is someone who's infected because um, then the, 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 those droplets don't have an ability to dissipate into the environment. And that's part of the reason why transmission rates are relatively low um, uh, when people are outside. Um, with, with within the hospital, what we have done uh, for for patients who are COVID positive is that as much as possible, we, we put them in what we call a negative pressure room, uh, meaning the air is sucked in, into the room um, as opposed to pushed out from the room to the you know the, the hallway or to you know neighboring rooms because that obviously would increase the risk of the virus sp spreading within the hallway or you know within the rooms um, next to each other. But we, we've, you know, in large part, the, the medical community has not found that to be, you know, uh, necessary or definitively, you know, effective. So, you know, there are plenty of patients across the country that were in non-negative pressure rooms and we did not see transmission within the hospital. Um, you know, part of that is multifactorial too. You know, we were all wearing masks um, when we we're at work. Uh, but um, I, I would have to defer that to a um, bioengineer in terms of what they're doing at the schools um, in terms of the circulation. But, you know, certainly no circulation is, is not good. Yeah. And um, speaking of masks, um, would love your take on, you know, we're, we're both sending you know, young kids to school um, in, in two weeks. Um, what mask, you know, how should we look at, you know, the type of mask? Um, what's the most effective? And I know you mentioned you, you, you have a little screen yeah. for us here. 
So, you know, we've, um, I'm going to share my screen here. And I, I think, is, is that screen up, Sam, the mask screen? I see it, yeah. Okay, so Duke University um, published a report um, a couple weeks ago that, that you know gained a lot of public attention. And what they did is they took a series of masks, um, about, uh, well, exactly 14 masks. In, in addition, they also tested uh, 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 volunteers that weren't wearing a mask. And they did a study, um, which some people have criticized, but you know, I, I think in general it was a pretty good study, uh, looking at the uh, the particles that were transmitted while you're wearing various masks. And some masks uh, perform really well, um, and some masks perform pretty poorly. So if you look on this uh, optic here, uh, number twelve, which is the bandana. Uh, number 11, which is a, a ski gator, and you know, I will willingly admit that that was one of the masks I used to wear, uh, particularly when I was running, uh, which I don't do anymore for a number of reasons. Um, and then number three, uh, which is the, the knitted mask, uh, th those perform uh, poorly compared to, to these other masks. And one of the distinguishing you know, features of the other masks that, that did perform pretty well, and some of them performed almost as well as an N95, you know, a, you know, a graded hospital healthcare issued N95, is that you've got a seal around the face. Um, you know, I'll, I'll sort of take this off here, but, but the, the most important thing is, is to get a mask that has a relatively good seal around the, the nasal bridge and certainly around the mouth. And just, as you can imagine, you know, those gaiters, um, those bandanas, and a lot of the knitted masks, uh, you know, because they're so flat, don't provide a nice seal. So, you know, uh, my kids will, you know, wear, you know, those uh, uh, dispo disposable um, uh, surgical masks, which, you know, have a aluminum foil that will help the seal, or they'll wear a form-fitted cotton mask. And you know, if you're going to wear a cotton mask, it's important to, to wash those every day because you know they get a lot of debris. And you know, you got to remember, it's not just COVID. There's a lot of other viruses and bacteria out there that you know be, that can be clinging onto those surfaces. But um, you know, I, I would recommend not wearing a bandana or a gaiter or a loose-fitted hand-sewn mask. Perfect. Um... Would love to hear your thoughts. You know, I, we, we've hung out a bunch this summer. You know, you've, you've told me uh, th this summer, this is a time to go outside and hang out with your friends at, 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 a, at, a, at, a, at a distance, at a small distance. Um, you're at my patio, you know, my patio or, you know, on, on a boat, whatever. Um, I just want to go on record that we're only outside, Sam. That is 100% correct, Steve, 100% correct. Um, you know, what else do you do? You know, do you do in your practice? Do you go to grocery stores? You know, what what are you doing? And sort of what are you what are you planning on doing this fall and winter to keep your family safe? Right. And also, we have another quick little question here on diet, exercise, um, any other type of proactive measures. Immune state. Absolutely. I've been taking those little packets every day. Um, yep. What are you doing to, stay, to to sort of you know stay safe and prepare for yeah uh, yeah this dark period. <laughs> You know, COVID is um, is is unique, but but it is you know another respiratory virus, and, and just like other respiratory viruses, you know you, your body has an immune response that can be boosted um, and better prepared to to tolerate uh, you know one an exposure as well as you know enduring an infection or an active infection. So. If, all those things that you mentioned, you know, eating well, um, getting good sleep, um, you know, making sure that you practice, you know, vigilant hand hygiene. And for those of you who do believe in it, I do, I'm not promoting any particular product, but you know, I do take immune boosters, um, you know, almost daily, particularly, you know, in the winter or, you know, when I have, have been traveling or traveling in the past. So anything that you would normally do to, you know, fight the flu or the common day cold, uh, you know, this is time to do it. Um, in terms of you know grocery shopping, uh, you know some people um, will you know shop in person. If, if you're going to do that, and, and I do that uh, periodically, you know I, I like to do it in, in bulk. So if you're going to go shop and, and expose yourself, um, you know though it should be a minimal exposure because I don't think there's 
uh, you know, any day soon where people who are in supermarkets are not going to be required to wear a mask. Um, the exposure is still minimal, but, you know, there's still exposure. You know, if you're going to go into a supermarket, just, just bulk up um, on your groceries so that you're not going repeatedly. Because if you go, you know, four times a week to get the same amount that you could do in, in one, one stop, then you're, you know, exposing yourself unnecessarily. Um, and I do a combination of, of you know, uh, grocery shopping online, and then, you know, I'll go in and, and get some fresh produce for the week. Um, but I, I try to minimize it as much as possible, and that, that's what I would recommend for everyone else. I have a question here on, um, you know, it's an interesting one on uh, vaccines. Is, do you know of anything in the current pipeline on T-cell or B-cell immunity as opposed to antibody immunity, which seems to be, you know, kind of what, 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 what a lot of, what the major ones that, that I've heard of are focused on? Yeah, so um, th those are different um, uh, cells in your immune system that, that will attack and confer immunity. Uh, the T cells tend to, you know, be the ones that rapidly attack and exposure, and the B cells, you know, provide long-term immunity. But there, there's a number of those that are being tested right now, and there's, there's a number of studies with the convalescent plasma to look at both T cells and B cells. But... Um, I don't know of any specific product that, that's about to emerge, but I, I know there's quite a number of um, uh, pharmaceuticals that are looking at both of those strategies. And, um, go, go, going back to some earlier questions, and we, we, we have about eight minutes, we'll sort of run through questions. There are a lot more questions that we can answer here, um, and maybe we can, we can sort of have a, fo you know, a, a follow-up. I, I, I'm gonna try to see if I can you know, collect these questions here if possible. And, uh, and Dr. Choi, sorry, sorry, I might, I might bother you to. to uh, not, get, you know, not at all. Um, one question coming uh, for, from from my my cousin Simi Zelson, who's listening in the audience here. Um, youth sports, um, colleges are canceling a lot of things, yeah. um, but you know there was little league this summer. There was there was summer camp. Um, how do you think about youth sports in particular? Um, you know, con youth contact sports. Um, you know, this fall and winter. Well, um, at the risk of getting lots of hate email um, and text, I, I th it poses a, a big risk um, for youth sports, um, particularly with younger kids who, you know, can't abide by mask wearing. Um, but you know, certainly the contact sports will, you know, uh, pose a greater risk for exposure for someone who's potentially infected, right? Um, so it's really hard to do that for for a contact sport. It's, it's very different if, if you're playing a sport that you can, you know, socially distance. And, you know, baseball happens to be one of them where, you know, the, the individual players aren't on top of each other. But, you know, even with baseball, the, the risk is, you know, if they're all sitting in the dugout uh, or on a bench uh, within six feet of each other and not appropriately wearing a mask or taking off the mask, you know, to – you know, have, have a drink of water or, or sports drink or, or talking um, and, and certainly yelling and coughing and spitting. All those are, you know, very high aerosol generating procedures. Um, you know, much like, you know, some of the risks that they've described for, for people who are in synagogues and churches and temples uh, or places of worship that where, you know, singing is a, you know, sort of primary activity. You know, that, that's a high uh, risk, uh, high aerosol gener generating activity. And, and so that, that, that becomes, you know, one of those typical super spreader uh, events. And, and, you know, we, we saw that, you know, last spring in, in New Rochelle. Um, we saw that in a couple cases in, in South Korea. So, you know, sports, sports are, are similar. Um, and particularly the sports that are going to be indoors. So if they're playing indoor basketball, it's, it's a risk. So, you know, I, I don't think there's any, any mitigating fact, factor or, or behavior or intervention that's going to eliminate all risk. I think parents just need to weigh the risk benefit. Um, but but I, I, I would say contact sports in particular uh, pose a much higher risk. And you travel. We have a, a question here on, you know, should I take my holiday this year? Um, getting in an airplane. Yes. What you Take the saying? holiday, just don't go on an airplane. <laughs> it's absolutely critical for, for people to take time off. Um, you know, myself included, this is, this is my second vacation day uh, since, since Christmas. So 
I think this is where you become creative. You know, you, you do staycations and you stay at home with your your family or your loved ones and you do things in the backyard or you do things, you know, in the local community that are outdoors. Uh, but I, I would highly advise against traveling. Um, you know, if, if you're gonna travel and you need to get out, then, you know, look at that advisory uh, link and, and make sure you go to a, a state or a location that has a low rate and a low prevalence because, you would be exposing yourself and, and your family potentially um, to, 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 to other individuals in that community that, that you know, are infected and, and are carrying the virus or have recovered and can still shed active virus. I mean, on airplane travel, you know, I, I know there's talk that the airplane, there's so much circulation in an airplane, but, you know, a lot of the airlines are still, still don't have the middle seats covered. Um, have there been, you know, the, on the contact tracing side, What's been sort of the prevalence of, of getting it from, you know, from travel, I guess, from point leaving your house, going through the airport, getting a, a, going on an airplane and getting to your destination? Is that one of the causes that's that sort of caused some of the spike in the country? Oh, yeah, absolutely. P people who are traveling, um, whether it's definitively from the the um, the presence of that individual at a crowded airport or sitting in an airplane and certainly absolutely certainly people coming from those high-risk states um it's clearly been a source of uh identification when they do contact tracing you know, it's, it's high risk and you, you got to remember it's about um the number of people that you're exposed to uh the distancing or the lack of distancing that, that you have between those people and the duration of that exposure. So if you think about it, an airplane is the perfect location for a virus to spread through a group of people. You're, you're on a plane for hours. You're on top of each other. And there's often a lot of people on an airplane. You know, I mean, if you're fortunate enough to tr fly privately, yeah, but if you're on a commercial airline, you know, you're talking about, you know, hundreds of people potentially on a flight or, you know, certainly dozens. Um, so it, it, it breaks, you know, all three rules, you know, people, distance, and duration. Um, last question, um, you know, and, and this was, you know, is, is from Ralph Falkenstein, um, SARS-CoV-2 SARS is a um, mainly a respiratory virus. What did you see during, you know, the, the peak of COVID affecting other parts of the body, heart, kidney, and, uh, and other organs? Well, you, you name the two primary ones, um, other than the lungs, but you know that's probably one of the sc more uh, scary uh, aspects of this virus. You know, it's only now that we're we're seeing the long-term sequelae. Um, so, you know, kidneys is is, is a huge um, vulnerability in terms of an organ uh, suffering other consequences outside of lungs. Um, definitely attacks the heart. Um, we, we've seen liver dysfunction, uh, we've seen neurological sequelae, and we, we, we've seen you know, muscular uh, impact from it as well. So um, th those are all common uh, sequelae of patients who have severe active disease. And you know, some of the more devastating uh, consequences in include um, you know, people who've lost uh, smell and taste, you know, which is devastating. And we, we've, we have cases where it, it still hasn't come back for, for a number of patients. And, and if you're like me, that, that would be devastating too. Yeah, well, I, I, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna let you in on a, on a, on a not, not, so, not such a dour note. Um, <laughs> with, with, with final words of wisdom, but first, um, I, I really wanna thank um, the, the Yale Alumni Health Network, Yale Alumni Association. Um, thank you all so much for joining us in this talk, you know, Accelerate Yale and, and, and Yale Angels. Um, we, we, we've been doing these since um, doing these webinars since uh, I guess mid March now, uh, Steve. I think you were the second one that that, that we did. Uh, we've probably done seventeen, eighteen. I don't even know how many, but uh, it's really been great to try to keep you know keep, really keep the community together during during this very challenging time. And so, thank you all so much for joining us, Steve. Any final words of wisdom for uh, for, for 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 the audience here? Wear your mask, be safe, and take care of each other. Great. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Choi. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Right. And um, everyone, take care. Have a good night. Right. Great to see you, Sam. Good night.